Hello. In episode 5 of the third series of AS for Architecture, I spoke with Liz Postlethwaite, participatory artist, permaculture designer and director of Small Things Creative Projects, a social enterprise addressing regenerative culture, based in Manchester. AS for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of AS for Architecture. I'm talking today to Liz Postlethwaite, uh, permaculturalist which doesn't really do you justice, Liz. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, so I'm Liz Postlethwaite, and I'm, um, I'm, I don't know if I've even described myself as a permaculturist, Ambrose, but I'm a participatory artist by trade, and my work has always been in public engagement and working with people. And through that practice, through the things that I was exploring and the things that I wanted to do, I found my way to permaculture and to permaculture design. Um, so I would say I'm a participatory artist who's interested in regenerative culture and then by way of that became interested in permaculture design because it's a really good way of making regenerative things. That's a really good corrective. And I think that, prob- that makes me think that probably no one who uses permaculture would use it in that way as a title that they do but as a mode of practice perhaps um so i was put into contact with you i have a good friend called priya logan who lives up in yeah. fife mm-hmm. um who's a remarkable character and i've constantly pester her via instagram about who could i speak to about permaculture because i'm interested in it as a device for helping students in architecture and design think about a more um, holistic and ethical means of engaging with the world and how we co-design it. And she recommended you. So I came to you, I think via Instagram, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah. Instagram's not all bad. It's not all bad. I mean, it's 98%. Pretty much all bad. (laughs) Yeah, but 2% of it, we can meet nice people. so I, I and I really wanted to speak about it because I, I I touch on it in my teaching, but I don't know it particularly well. And it's not something that I can I don't have the facilities to deploy in my life in a day to day way. But perhaps that's something you can correct as well. So I thought perhaps we could start by you actually explaining as a as a as an artist what permaculture culture is from where you are situated, how you understand it um, and what it does. So I think a good way to start talking about that is to tell you about kind of how I came to permaculture and permaculture design, right? So so I about I did a permaculture design course about 13 years ago, and I came to permaculture design because I had an, well, for two different reasons, really. I had an allotment and a garden that I wanted to design, and I was freaking out about the climate crisis. <laughs> and I found permaculture design, and I did a permaculture design course, and it was it was kind of a revelation because I realized like other people were thinking the same things that I was thinking and other people wanted to do the same things. And what I realized from that permaculture design course as well was that permaculture design is not just about designing gardens, that it's this set of quite radical tools that you can use, you can apply to anything really. So then from that, then I was thinking about my arts practice and my practice as a participatory artist. And I and, and suddenly I was like a permaculture practitioner, like a really baby one, but I was a permaculture practitioner in one hand. And I was an I was an activist getting increasingly evolved, involved in activism around kind of the climate and the ecological crisis. And then I was an artist. And then all of these things were like separate hats. And I realized that permaculture design was a really good way of bringing all of those things together. And um, I started using permaculture design to think about like how those different aspects sit together and how they run side by side. So, so that was and then I got got really interested that like a lot of permaculture design is an invitation to explore like the edge and about like how really interesting things happen in wild spaces and edges and where where different things meet. And as a participatory artist, that's really the area that you're working in a lot of the time. That's where you're exploring. So then I got really interested in like this meeting ground between permaculture design and participatory creative practice. So that's kind of how all of those different things come together. 
But on a simplest level for me, so a lot of people talk about why did you why did you go on this course? I suppose that's a good question. So what was lacking Permacul- in how you were acting and, and practicing that that made you think permaculture might be a sensible thing to be doing? Or at least Because I want I I wanted to do things and I wanted to make things better. And also um on a simple level, I wanted to design an allotment and I wanted to understand how I could do that in alignment with the natural world better right. and permaculture seemed to be offering that yeah. and actually now i understand that permaculture design is a lot more complex than that and that it offers a lot more than that which is mm. what's really exciting and i think that's what a lot of people find that they come to it because they want to grow stuff and then they realize it's like a domino effect that they're like oh wow it's not just about my garden it's about my life and it's about my job and it's about how my children are educated and it's about all of those different things but it was that first thing about wanting to just make an allotment but then what's really good about food growing is that um food growing really deeply helps you understand the interconnectedness of things and as soon as you start to grow food so that's why i think it's a real like radical step for so many people that you grow food and then you understand that you can't grow good food without clean air and clean soil and all of these different things. So that's how I came to it. But I think it's interesting to say, so you, you, you've you used the word a lot, um, permaculture, but to me, um, what I'm interested in is permaculture design. So permaculture is a noun and it's a bit of a slippery noun because because what does it like what does it mean when you talk about permaculture and to me when you talk about permaculture so bill mollison when he was who founded the permaculture movement as we know it when he was talking about permaculture really what he was talking about was about regenerative culture which is about living culture which is about um cultures that that um are about life and about bringing life and we are alive on the planet because the planet is regenerative mm-hmm. and then on the flip side of that we have industrial culture, which is what our culture is, which is a deeply extractive culture. So you've got permaculture, but then what I'm interested in is permaculture design and permaculture design is a verb and it's something you do and it's a set of tools that you use to make regenerative things. So so that's quite an interesting definition for me because yeah. then, then it's really exciting because permaculture design, it doesn't belong to anybody. It's open source. Anybody can use it. Anybody can get involved in it. But at its heart is this, um, is this, this thing which Bill Mollison started thinking about, which is about systems design. And then it's about um, inspiration from nature. And it's about an ethical basis. Mm-hmm. And, permaculture asks you to do all of those permaculture design is an invitation to think Mm. about all those three things at the same time so it's sort of in in contrast to sort of an an ordinary design practice which can be seen to be quite linear and hierarchical and certainly say for example for architectural design can be quite a top-down process this is a much more holistic and piecemeal and perhaps uh non-linear doesn't really make sense i suppose but sort of like a smorgasbord, like there's things to pick away at and you don't have to do them in any particular order. I mean, yeah, which I which I really find quite, quite fascinating. You mentioned edges earlier, <coughs> excuse me, and edge conditions. And this is one of the areas that I like to talk to my students about. And I talk to, talk to them about it specifically in relation to kind of... Um, the nature of the built environment where you get two types of built environment come together and it produces friction essentially and friction produces heat and heat is generative um and the example that i always use is a photograph of blackpool blackpool pleasure beach i mean blackpool is one of the greatest places on earth but for all the wrong reasons no where you get this amazing human activity and natural activity and the, the 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 space between them generates this extraordinary form of behavior 
and also an extraordinary form of architecture and performative practice. I mean, literally on one side of the road, it's inappropriate to walk around in your underwear. And on the other side of the road, it's in, not only inappropriate, but it's expected. On one side of the road, you kind of are normal. And on the other side of the road, you start doing cartwheels with your children and eating gritty sandwiches and all of these kinds of things. So there's this idea of edges, which I find really fascinating. But I was wondering, what are these design principles beyond edges? And what does, like, how, how, do, how do we start applying them? So there's, so, so there's two different things. Often people talk about the permaculture principles. And actually what they're talking about is the permaculture ethics. So okay. at the heart of permaculture design, um, Bill, Bill Mollison, um, he... I th- before I say this, I'm just going to say one other thing, right? Mm-hmm. Bill Mollison, um, when you talk about like permaculture, it's really important to frame that Bill Mollison didn't invent permaculture. Permaculture mm-hmm. is regenerative culture, and that is how indigenous culture and indigenous wisdom has always existed and continues yeah. to exist. So what essentially what Bill Mollison was um, starting to do was say as an industrialized culture how Mm. can we start to live regeneratively regeneratively again but it's really important to frame that a lot of the tools and a lot of the things that Bill Mollison is proposing he didn't invent those things and he didn't Mm. claim to invent those things but what was unique was about him bringing them to a systems thinking perspective and Mm. to this ethical basis so at the heart of permaculture is this idea of centering everything around three ethics. And those ethics are earth care, people care, and fair share. And actually the third ethic, fair share, um, Bill Mollison originally um, framed that ethic as uh, limits to population and consumption. And it's kind of developed over time. And now it's about earth care, people care, and fair share, or sometimes people say future care for that third ethic. But lots of things change in permaculture the tools that people use the frameworks that people use but essentially those ethics stay the same Mm. and it's almost as though this is this like ethical core that sits at the heart of permaculture design and i think what's interesting is people often say what's the difference between biomimicry and permaculture because biomimicry is about taking inspiration from nature to design things. But biomimicry doesn't have an ethical proposition at the heart of it. So you can look at biomimicry and say, oh, I'm going to design a fabric that's inspired by a leaf, so it's waterproof. And then I'm going to make shoes from it. But the shoes are going to be made in a sweatshop by people who aren't paid properly. Out so, of oil. Pardon? Out, out of oil. Yeah. So so at its heart, permaculture design it has got those ethics that sit at mm-hmm. the heart of it. And everything comes back to those ethics. And those yeah. ethics might be an aspiration that you're moving towards. They might be um, kind of a way that you um, evaluate what you've done, but they sit there all the time. And then um, from them, and they're they're really amazing because they're like fiendish in their simplicity. Like people go, well, what's so radical about like talking about earth care and people care and fair share, but but like what does care mean? And if we really care for the earth, then what does that mean? And how, if we're in a caring relationship with each other and with place and then fair share is a, a is a scope around like then social justice and climate justice and equity. And if if we're really making things that embody them ethics, then like what does that mean and how do those things look? And then if care is not just about our species, but if it's about all species, then how does it look again? And so the ethics are this central lens that um starts to move us towards those things I suppose and then I think what's really interesting if you look at those ethics if you look at like ancient cultures and indigenous cultures and living cultures most of those cultures at the heart of them have ideas or kind of an ethical core though they might not be defined as an ethical core and that's what they're about they're about earth care they're about people care and they're about fair share in different ways 
manifested in different ways, worded in different ways. So then from that, you come to the permaculture principles. And so then Bill Mollison and, and David Holmgren, and David Holmgren was like a designer who was working with Bill Mollison, said, well, actually, like um, the ethics, like they were a bit woolly and they were a bit like, what do they actually mean? And how might we how might we start to think about actually um, the ethics coming into existence in the real world? So he then started thinking about permaculture principles and 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 David Hol- um, Holmgren created a list of 12 principles um, which he felt or fe- feels were um, principles of existence that you, you would see in every natural system. So if you looked at a pond in your garden, you would mm-hmm. see these, these things happening. And if you looked at a tundra, you would see these things happening. If you looked at a rock pool, you would see these things happening. So they're kind of the like... Um, repeated features of natural systems, for want of a better word. Mm -hmm. And then if we think about what we're doing as living systems and use those principles, they help us. um, The idea is that they help us better center those ethics and move towards those ethics in the creation of living systems or regenerative systems. That was a really long answer. Fantastic, though. Really clear. You've done this before. I, um, but there, so at the heart of it, it's a mode of sort of, it seems to me these, so you have this ethical basis. And I think that difference between biomimicry, for example, um, and, and how you're describing permaculture is really interesting. Like one, yeah, one is mimetic and one is about ethics. And I, and I, I'm really interested in that idea. But then the actual principles themselves, are inescapably ethical in their approach. And it's sort of, it seems to me that they are about a deportment towards the activity of, in this case, design, rather than um, defining, neatly defining what you have to do to be that designer. I think that's that's true. And then... It goes beyond that, though, because there's then a set of tools and that's where permaculture design comes in. And there's lots of different tools, Mm -hmm. like almost an infinite number of tools then that help you do these things and help you observe better and think better. But what I think is really interesting is with the proposition of permaculture design as well. So we have that. So. Part of our problem is as a species that we see ourselves as removed or separate from the natural world. We've we've lost track of the fact that we are just one part of a complex living world. We're just one part of a complex living system. And in that sense, so I think foraging is a really good example, right? So foraging is now quite trendy and quite popular. But it is, it's really annoying, isn't it? Because it was but, cool. I used and to people do it. Go, sorry. No, I, I used to do it and think I was being alternative. And now you've just got some some trustafarians doing it. It's like really heartbreaking. But what's quite interesting is that like, so if we talk about our culture as being extractive and then we're looking at moving towards regenerative cultures, just because you're engaging in the natural world doesn't mean it's regenerative. A lot of people forage extractively. So they yeah. go somewhere and they take everything. Yeah. or they, And really, to me... You cannot forage regeneratively unless you tend to the place that you are foraging, unless you have a a reciprocal um, exchange with that place. So permaculture design is about like um, recal. It's almost like. It's like it's like it's like an invitation to re-examine our relationship with the world. I find Anita. this really, this is a really interesting point because, and I was going to ask you about this idea of donut economics or circular economies, because I think there might be some kind of crossover there. But I was I was looking at this recently and I was doing a project, what well, I'm doing a project where there's some material reuse. And as you were saying about sort of indigenous populations and perhaps older generation, uh, older um, epochs, older a- ages of our in our own culture, this actually is a native, this is native to the human animal. This is what we do. 
we share things, we don't waste things. And what I find quite interesting about the kind of, and the, the reason that I, I make my rather acerbic and silly point about people taking over this idea of foraging is, is that they're turning into something that is a commodity. It's becoming a thing that you can package, brand, sell. And I feel a little bit like that about donut economics. It's like you're just repackaging medievalism, but you're doing it for a percentage. Is that fair? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know enough about donut economics to 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 comment on that. But I think what's quite interesting is that, um, funnily enough, I was facilitating a course last night, and we were talking about donut economics, and someone said, "Oh, that, that like I've been reading about donut economics, and it's just like perm, like it's it's like um, it's like permaculture." And I think that's what's interesting to me about that is that um, that. Permaculture is not the only way of create, creating regenerative things. You can create regenerative things in lots of different ways. And like donut economics is a really interesting example that like, and they've got a lot of tools and they've created a lot of tools and you can go on their website and you can sign up and you can do different things. To me, what's really exciting about permaculture design is that like anybody can do it. Yeah. You don't have to, you can do a permaculture design course and you can do a permaculture diploma and i would recommend you to do that if you can if you can because it's a really good way of deepening your skills as a permaculture designer but actually like donut economics belongs to somebody if that makes sense but permaculture design doesn't belong to anybody and in that sense it it belongs to everybody mm. and anybody can do it and everybody can do it and that's what is exciting to me about it is that it's got this kind of DIY open source aspect to it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a community of people with a shared aspiration and a shared set of tools. And then that's why the ethics are important because mm. the ethics sit at the heart and kind of guide that, that ship of shared mm. aspiration, I guess. Because often folks say, oh, I've got a permaculture garden or like, I've, you know, this is a permaculture project. Um, but then nobody's paid to participate in it or um, or the staff are all really burnt out. And then you're like, well, is it really a permaculture project? Mm. Where's the people care in that? So, so in that respect, I see the connection with, with – there's a lot of connections and a lot of crossovers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of different ways to get to this regenerative place, but I've still not found a better way than permaculture design yeah. for doing it. Um, and then what's really exciting as well about permaculture design, um, like if you look at most of the design frameworks that are being used in permaculture design, they're not unique to permaculture. They're design frameworks that come from other places. Mm. But what's unique is using them through that lens of systems thinking, natural wisdom and ethics. And that is what's unique about it. So then you look at donor economics and you go, oh, I love that tool they've used there. I'm going to use that in a permaculture design process. Mm -hmm. And you can, because mm -hmm. so long as you're um, keeping those ethics at the heart of your thinking, then it's not that it's a free for all, but it's something that changes. And then what's really exciting is because it changes, the way that you would use permaculture design in Kent would be different to how I would use it in Bury, because yeah. everywhere's unique and every context is unique. And wow. therefore, how we use the tools is a unique response yeah. to unique context. Yeah. So you've talked a lot about systems thinking. Um and I thought perhaps how you understand that might be useful to understand uh, to to and complex systems. But I was I, I, and I like this idea. I like this idea of moving away from this kind of very discrete, bounded idea of a site or a context, and we design for that place. And we might look at a little bit of local culture in a kind of critical regionalist way. We might like add a bit of like. I don't know, local context, bit of timber, bit of a weird shape here or there, some windows to get the light in. 
But there's also, so we're trying to break away from that kind of narrowness. But at the same time, within this system, there is complex, there, there is boundedness. So, so it's not, it's not amorphous. It's not generating an idea of the earth as an amorphous space, but there's specificity here as well that you have to learn to interact with. Are the tools of permaculture able to help you understand that specificity? Or is that something that comes, you know, like, like how is it, I, I guess what I'm saying is in, in this kind of very modernist kind of way is like, how do we measure it before we act? Like, how do we start? And obviously one of the key principles of, of, of permaculture is, is this idea of observation. Yeah. Like, what does this look like? How do we set this out? And then what does this lead to? So I so so Bill Mollison as a designer, I suppose I'm ask, asking you as a designer and as an artist here. Yeah. So Bill Mollison spoke about like um, I'm, I'm misquoting this a little bit because I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it was about um, a process of, um, of of kind of deep observation of long and deep observation rather than kind of rash, uh, rather than rash doing if that makes sense so mm -hmm. the longer that you look and the better that you look and the 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 more you're going to be able to 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 interact with yeah. the world or the world that you're part of so in that sense so there's so many interesting things and actually um i mean i could talk about this for ages really but so so often as like designers or like artists, as participatory artists, we're asked to go in and solve a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a problem and we have to create a solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. Actually, what permaculture and, and then there's this idea that like we often we come in from outside and we try to do something like we, we come in and we're like an outsider being asked to solve a problem or asked to create to create a a solution mm -hmm. but almost what permaculture design is asking you to do is um to just observe reality in a non-judgmental way so you go into a space and when you go into that space you become part of that space so in that interaction in that going in you then are part of that ecology just mm -hmm. being there you're gonna have an impact whether you do anything or not, because just the being there has changed it. But mm -hmm. it's asking, it's an invitation to just observe the reality in a non-judgmental way. So if we go back to nature, so I'm I'm um, involved in a community woodland near where I live. So if we observe that space, we've got like hundreds, we've got like almost a hundred acres of giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed and balsam. So we can either see that as like a problem. Oh, that's a really big problem. What are we going to do to solve that problem? Or we can just see that as an abundance. The reality of that space is that our current abundance is these plants. Um, so then we've got an option. We can either um, find a use for that abundance or we can look at how we can make interventions that change the balance so the abundance is changed change and the things that we want to become abundant are there instead yeah. and then that's really interesting and then I've, it was actually an architect on one of the permaculture courses that I ran and she said what if we what if we stop thinking about solving problems and we start thinking about creating new knowledge instead and about like the interventions that we can have to create the abundances that we want. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really interesting then about like that, how that changes our relationship and how it changes that proposition, I guess. Um, yeah, it is yeah. a really, I mean, the, so the architect is, the architect's tool is building. So they see the world through too often apparently see the world the, the the solution to any problem is building it's like a doctor always sees the solution to any problem as medicine or surgery like maybe it's not maybe there's a holistic way of dealing with the health thing or the, the space thing and maybe building is the last thing we should be doing 
and and as you say, sort of spending time in nature and I, uh, well in 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 a context which really calls for a totally different deportment. How does it work in your? So you've talked about this this um, this woodland that you're working with. It's Japanese knotweed. Um, how does it work in your own artistic practice? So from my point of view, my practice now is totally different to what it was 10 years ago when I started this kind of journey of permaculture. And so on a simplest level, so we, so you asked a little bit before about systems, right? So we live in a, com- we are one part of a complex living system. That's mm-hmm. all we are. Like, like get rid of our egos and our projects and, and the things we own and whatever. And we're, we're just one part of a 4.6 billion year evolution of a complex regenerative system. And we're here as a result of being part of a regenerative system. So if you think every, every part of that regenerative world's role is to take what they need from that system and positively contribute how they can to that system. So if we like, if I if if we reframe our individual existence and our individual practice and the things we do as making a positive contribution to that system, then it blows your mind a little bit, but also it it's really um freeing as well mm-hmm. because it's about being present and about contributing and about seeing how I can positively contribute to a multi-species complex world. Yeah. And obviously there's privilege in that of how we can do that and all of those things. So then for me, in terms of my practice, um, then I was working all over the place. I was working in lots of different places, doing lots of different things. And then I realized like um, how, what benefit, so I can, one of, things that Bill Mollison was really interested in was starting from your own back door and working out. So I, as an artist, as a creative person, bring something unique to a community, to a place. And that's why people commission artists and bring artists in to do things because they bring a unique perspective. So what if I looked at how that would benefit my immediate community? Like, what does it look like being an artist in a place? and relating to that place and seeing what contribution I can make. Mm. So a lot of my interventions now are like quite hyper local. Yeah. Um, and uh, and actually like when you look at like the climate crisis and the ecological crisis, um, I think a lot of that is about hyper local solutions and about like how we reconnect with place um, on a local level. Um, and a lot of that has been for me about then this wild space that I'm involved with and how my practice is an intervention in that space and mm-hmm. how it, it um, engages with that space and mm-hmm. this place where I live as well. Yeah. How, how can I contribute in a regenerative way to the place I call home, I guess. And then as a result of that, it, I don't just do stuff here. I'm not just within this five miles from my home. But like when you, then you realise what the abundances are where you live and yeah. what you can contribute to that abundance. Yeah. So I guess I've become really interested in artists as and all of us as creatures of place and... Um, and what that means yeah it's lovely i mean it's a lovely idea before we started recording before we started recording recording i suppose you were talking about bury where you're from where you are at the moment in relation to manchester which it's his ugly big brother next door um and you were talking about bury as a kind of a kind of good town i suppose a place that is unto itself sub- sort of has is culturally self-sustaining versus a city like Manchester. And I was talking to a, a, 
a writer from Stockport yesterday, Paul Dobyshik, about a book he's written about animals and architecture. And um, quite interesting to watch the drift in various fields of academic and and and, um, and in literature towards this idea of, which I think is, I, I think permacultural thinking has been at the heart of it, but it's like this quiet ghost that creeps around changing people's mind because people are starting to talk in in many ways about it but he was talking about manchester as this kind of sort of uber globalized animal it like sort of out of control in a way like its urban regeneration is sort of out of control and the times i've been there recently i've certainly felt like none of this is making any sense i mean one of the things paul was saying was that manchester's city center population now is higher than it's ever been even during the industrial revolution like they're ramming it with people um, so I was wondering whether we might just think about this place that you're from, like what, what causes a place in a way to embody certain aspects of, I don't want to use the word sustainable because I think it's a weak word or it's a confusing word or it's an easily manipulated word, but let's call it a permacultural place versus a, a, a place like Manchester. And is a place like Bury only really sustainable because Manchester is taking is doing all the heavy lifting by being an uber global capitalist place? Um, I think places like Bury will last a lot longer than mm-hmm. uber global Manchester. Mm-hmm. And I think... I think there's so many interesting things around that. So Bury's like a small town, quite a big small town, but it's got its own sense of identity. And mm-hmm. um, it helps that we've got a market. So we've got connection to food and food systems. We've yeah. got it's got a cultural life. Um it's got its own ecology, I guess. Yeah. And um it's got its own identity. But I think what's really interesting, so uh when you talk about like Manchester and talk about cities, like, and this is quite big ideas here, but like we're at this point of like really significant transition as a species, like big changes are afoot because the planet is like two degrees hotter than, than it was a hundred years ago. So, so big change is coming whether we like it or not and and we've we've at, we're at a point of transition where we can either embrace that change and try to make things that are better or we can wait for the change to come and try and respond to it and 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 in asking those questions maybe there's questions of whether some of the forms that we've got are suitable anymore for the world that we now live in yeah and whether and i'm not just talking about the like the scale of cities but institutions and organizations and all of these different things and um and dougald hein has written like really eloquently about a lot of these things in his like new book at work in the ruins. And I would really like recommend people to have a look at that book, but about how like we've got kind of these institutions like these cities and we've assumed that they will provide answers Mm -hmm. or that they will provide solutions. And I think maybe the reality is that they're not that, they're not able to provide the answers to the questions that we're now asking. Well, I think and... I think this is a, a really good point. And it's something that I've been thinking about in relation to architecture for a while, insofar as I've been thinking about uh, architecture as an instrument for justice, environmental, um, spatial, social justice for quite a while. And I came to a sort of rather bleak, but I thought possibly a nadir, so only way is up kind of thing, idea which was that actually architecture isn't an instrument for justice. As we'd practice it and as it produces, it's entirely the wrong instrument. It's sort of like taking jelly and trying to put in nails with it. It's like you can keep going, but all you're doing is getting jelly all over your hand and stabbing yourself with a nail. And, And I wonder whether something like permaculture is that moment is that fulcrum point around which we could reorientate the whole of our practice 
with this idea right at the beginning, this this, this tripartite ethical framework, which I think is lovely. Um, and as you say, very obvious and and kind of, I would suggest native to the human species, like this is what actually we do outside, you know, all things being equal outside, you know, systemic um, uh, problematics like this idea about cities having to be in this kind of form or whatever it is, that that's what humans do. But I was going to ask you just to, to, as a final question, if you were to come into an architecture school, you, Liz Postlethwaite, you are come into an architecture school and you are to be presented with some fourth or fifth year architecture students who've become already quite habituated to a certain mode of practice. What, how would you get them or you were to go into an architecture practice who's like does building as usual which by the way i'm not under i'm not undermining and i'm not criticizing in terms of its own genius it is phenomenal what architects do they're amazing and i'm only just getting my head around quite how incredibly complex they they are but if they were if you were to give be given the chance of reforming a practice or an educational year and say around permaculture what would you have them do how would you start them on this journey um, so there's two different things. I teach like or facilitate, convene lots of um lots of their quite unique permaculture courses for artists and creatives. And in the first session of those uh of all of those courses, what we explore is um this difference between you touched upon it before that sustainability is such a flawed word yeah. but this move from the extractive to the, the sustainable to regenerative and we know that we know we know that we need to return to regenerative because what we are doing in our extractive behavior is we are diminishing the planet's ability to support life that's what we're doing so then for a lot of people once that and then we we um we scrutinize what regenerative actually means and i don't mean about like urban regeneration because that is not regenerative normally and then once you once you really deeply start to think about what regenerative means it changes <laughs> your perspective on everything but you can't so there's two different things then you can't make people want to do that they have to be there they have to want to do it themselves yeah. so i'm not i'm not in the business of trying to change people's minds people come to this because they realize it's what's needed if that makes sense and then the un there's two other things then that we move to think about and I think this is really interesting. You cannot make regenerative things. What you can do is make the context in which the regenerative flourishes, if that makes sense. So then it changes the relationship because you're not making something. It's like gardening. You can't make wild. You can only help to create the spaces where it's possible. Mm -hmm. So then it's about reconsidering that relationship with place and that relationship with the world and then the third thing is about the ethics and and to me if everybody just used the permaculture ethics as a yardstick for what they do the world would be a totally different place so um and if I go to somewhere and someone says the ethic that it's rubbish, that's not possible, that that's not whatever, um, then fine. I, I I don't I'm not really investing my energy in having that conversation because um, the extractive world that that um, is the scaffold of a lot of these institutions isn't possible either. It's dead, mm. and. Um, and that's really, really interesting. So for me, that is where the starting point is. What does regenerative mean? What does it mean in the context of this world? You know, what does a regenerative hospital look like? 
what does a regenerative because it's not just our farms that need to be regenerative everything we do needs to be regenerative what does a regenerative school look like um, and then moving from that to this first step is about thinking about those ethics mm -hmm. and then once you start to grasp those two things then you want to learn more because mm -hmm. you you need the tools in order to do them i don't know if you've read the book it's not a permaculture book specifically but there's a brilliant book called hospicing modernity um by a writer called um Van Vanessa Machado de Oliveira and she um talks like brilliantly about a lot of these things about um not moments of judgment but moments of honesty with ourselves about what we do in the world and, and maybe some of those conversations so if you look at ecology you normally in every ecosystem you have producers and you have consumers and you have decomposers and death and loss. And maybe part of this journey that we're on is about letting go of some of the institutions or some of the forms that we have become quite connected to and accepting that that decomposition will create compost and new soil that will be what allows the growth of new things mm -hmm. but we shouldn't assume that we will know what those new things look like yeah. and we shouldn't assume that we're the people who are going to create them <laughs> maybe sometimes our best thing we can do we come from the culture that created this crisis so we shouldn't assume that we have to find the answers and maybe the best thing we can do as creatives is sometimes about holding space for to allow other people to be the center of that conversation and um to allow or hold that space for people to ask better questions as well and my final thing that i would say is that permaculture my friend tom is a brilliant permaculture designer and he always says um permaculture design it doesn't offer you the solutions but it helps you ask the best possible questions so maybe our role as artists as architects as musicians is about um we have a unique role in society we're allowed to do things we we are allowed sometimes to behave and act and function in ways that other people aren't so if we're going to use that privilege regeneratively then i think that's about holding space, about allowing those conversations to centre on other people and other species and about asking the best questions. And that is what I would say. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Nice point to finish on. That'll do nicely. Thanks to Liz for coming on the show, for sharing so generously of her time, knowledge and insights. See the podcast description for links to her professional and social spaces and to Small Things Community Project's website. As the Mandalorian said, this is the way. Thanks for listening. <laughs>